go live. Oh, okay, we're live. All righty. <laughs> so we're going to start. Welcome to our first impression for April. I am Nakia White, the founder and national chair of Latini. And then uh, joining me, okay. we have Tawanda, Alrighty. who is the uh, chapter okay. leader of Atlanta and one of the founders of DMV. April. Um, do you guys hear me? I feel like I, I hear you, but I heard an echo and it sounds yeah. like that. <laughs> is that the sound or from somebody else's computer? Um, okay. Yeah, I wouldn't. Yeah, I, I just closed my Facebook. So hopefully now we have no problem. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, so we have Tawanda from the Atlanta chapter. Hey, girl, hey. Hi. <laughs> and then we have Christia from the DMV chapter. Hey, girl, hey. Hey. Both members are on the book board, but also in leadership in their um, individual chapters. And we're going to talk about Behind Her Eyes. Behind Her Eyes is our um, book to screen selection. It's an international bestseller by Sarah Pimborough. It falls in the thriller suspense category, but the membership voted it in for our book to screen month because there's a series adaptation um, on Netflix that uh, premiered in February of this year, and it's been a really popular watch. So we're going to talk about the first 49 pages today. Um, first impression is usually based on the first chapter, first chapter, first impressions, but the first chapter is literally like six sentences so it's not much to talk about um so we decided to do the first uh 49 pages before we delve in i wanted to ask both of you have you watched the series at all or did you so no i purposely waited to read the book before starting the series um because i like to let my imagination do its thing Whereas if I see the series first, I'm whatever actors and story liberties they've taken is going to be stuck in my mind. So I usually try to go with the book first. Yeah, I was gonna say, since I nominated it and I knew it was a possibility, I purposefully haven't watched um, just because I was like, just in case um, I wanna see this first. And then because they talk so much about like a big twist, I would rather read that twist first than mm -hmm. kind of first and then go back to the book and then I know they made casting changes so I know that I would have that cast in my head versus what's actually described in the book um I am on the same page with both of you uh <laughs> I I'm one of those people that I have to read the book first um always if if I'm going to watch the movie or the series that um it is adapted to so I haven't watched it, but I've heard, what, what have you guys heard about the series? Have you heard anything? I've heard it's pretty juicy, that the twist is unexpected and um, that, yeah, I mean, I've only know, heard from about it from a couple of people, but people seem to be into it, so. Yeah. I hear shenanigans, uh, <laughs> woman shenanigans. Um, <laughs> so... And then, you know, like it's interesting because it's written and the main character is a white woman and then it switched to a black woman on screen so they're like uh -huh. those things that are happening there are more interesting with this shift so right yeah right so one thing that piqued my interest uh somebody on twitter was like they got this black woman over here acting like a white woman <laughs> that is hilarious <laughs> like getting you know uh getting away with stuff and just reacting to stuff that uh we don't you know we don't react that way but it was inter it was very funny because it was like oh let's see how things are when we get to act like them you know what I mean so that definitely piqued my interest um in watching this series now the book doesn't have a black woman but um which is another reason why I'm like let me read the book first mm -hmm. um and to see if they do kind of change her a little bit but it sounds like they didn't if she acting like a white woman so right. we shall see <laughs> of like a like to have like a blonde white woman shift in, yes. um because they like very clearly say she's blonde and yeah so that they didn't shift the character who is more racially ambiguous the wife who they say like looks like angelina jolie 
that she wasn't the one they made into a black woman that it's like this like blonde woman that they were and also mm-hmm. a blonde woman who's like a receptionist that they were like we'll put her in that role yeah um okay let's start off with the book let's delve into the book now so the first thing I noticed the book starts off with a quote from Benjamin Franklin yeah that says <laughs> that says three can keep a secret if two are dead and when I saw that I was like lord what is going on <laughs> like they just get to it immediately okay I was murder like, was dying. <laughs> murder 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 i'm like, I was like ben was on that <laughs> 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 I said, benjamin franklin did they is this like, oh my god are they sure <laughs> <laughs> so yeah that was uh i guess that was preparing us for what yes. we're about to delve into no that was um, foreshadowing like i mean well i don't know i've only read the 49 pages but i'm like okay mm-hmm. this is foreshadowing let me just <laughs> Uh, Christia did you read more than the 49 pages or no I didn't I wanted to but I was like no I will stop at the 49 because I was like especially when it's like a mystery of some sort I don't know if like when we're going to find out something so Mm -hmm. I I want to go further than that and I didn't want to accidentally spoil it for our members and be like yeah that's when because Benjamin Franklin (laughs) (laughs) so (laughs) right Okay, so the uh, the first chapter, like I said, is really small, it's just a few lines, and it's not really telling as much. It's like some nameless person somewhere in a room who hopes to get out, and there's a clock. That's all we know. Okay, so that's chapter one. <laughs> that's chapter one. Um, second chapter is also a few lines. It's short. It's like a third of a page, and they're following a man who's done something creepy and bad. We don't know what he's done, but he is I'm assuming he killed somebody I'm pretty sure the people are assuming that he killed and buried somebody because he's walking home with mud and leaves on his clothing and there's not a lot of information given to us um other than a line that says a thing had to be a thing had been done that could not be undone a terrible necessary act so immediately I'm like he killing people um and whatever went, whatever happened happened at night because as he's entering or pulling up to the house, the sun is rising, right? Um, did you guys have any ideas? So I thought the same thing as you from those first couple of, um, I guess, introductions. Um, however, later on, Adele goes on to talk about a cat being buried in the backyard and not wanting to bring that up because you know, she didn't want to make things tense. And so I'm like, are they killing animals? <laughs> like, you know, sociopathic behavior. Yeah. yeah. And I, I think was like, how did this cat die? Right. <laughs> like, what happened here? And she mentions like dirt under her fingernails also. So yes. I was like, she killed the cat. Who has killed, how did the cat <laughs> die? <laughs> there are questions. <laughs> right, right. Um. So I was, I feel like you just gave me not a spoiler but now that you said that now I'm thinking they killed the cat and that's why he was walking to the house with dirt on his and leaves and stuff yeah um oh thank you for connecting that yeah no I thought that as well because then I was like did she <clears throat> bury the cat in the garden where is the cat buried how did the cat die? like it just was like there's clearly something wrong with this couple I mean immediately <laughs> From Very like wrong. the description of like, I do everything. Like I, you know, the cat, I guess she buried it or ki- like- I thought she did. It. She mentioned yeah, she Yeah, she's well, like- Well, I was gonna get to that later. Together yeah. and like, cleaned up. And so it's just like this strange dynamic that's established pretty early on where we're like, okay, are you just trying to like fake us out that he did kill someone and then unrelated yeah. is this cat dying and being buried in your garden or like what happened? Yeah. Right. In chapter three, it gets a bit longer. Um, it in, the beginning of the chapter indicates that we are meeting Adele. So Adele is the first name we finally get. We don't know who these people are until chapter three. And, and um, the chapter is focused on Adele's point of view. Um, she's at home and a man arrives. I'm assuming it's the man from chapter two, right? A man arrives and we aren't told, uh, wait, the woman and man are married. The woman seems to have helped him with what the necessary acts because she mentions having dirt under her fingers, like you said, Christia. Um, but she's showered and she got cute for him. 
And they mentioned that she cleaned up all signs of previous rage, like she had to clean up glass and he had stormed out earlier. So there is clearly some tension, something is going on. Um, she made dinner for him to please him and he ignores it. He goes up to, he says he's going to bed, but he's not going to their bed, to a separate room is where he's going. And she says, I love you. And he also ignores it. So yeah, there are a couple that clearly has issues. Um, she has a lot of guilt. She feels unworthy. Um, and they did just purchase the house that they're in. And there's indication that they had, they were trying to start over, start fresh, start new. Um, and it's just very mysterious. Mm -hmm. so <laughs> I'm like what the hell is going on you know yeah and it also I think also adding to the mystery is that those former chapters are just then and later and now um mm -hmm. and so there's not really a time frame given us which is why we're like well is did he kill a body did he kill a cat was this last <laughs> night <laughs> like where are we in the timeline of their story um I can like kind of throw you off kilter as a reader, but I like yeah. that because I think it kept me engaged as a reader. Um, mm -hmm. so yeah, they're an odd couple for sure. <laughs> yeah, it makes you want to figure out what is going on, you know, what is going on. Um, chapter four, we meet Louise, okay? <laughs> Louise is a completely separate character. Um, the chapter starts off, she's with her friend Sophie. They're just shooting the shit, talking about life, I guess. And Louise is basically talking about she she met this guy at a bar. They had a long, she had a long talk. They made out. She has not had a whiff of a man in a very long time. So she was like really excited. But it was on some like, we're going to do this. We're not going to know each other's names. Let's just go with the flow type thing. And then the next is it the next day? I didn't really, I don't remember the time, timing, but she yeah. eventually finds out this guy's her new boss. He comes in for a tour of the office and with his wife, she had no idea he was married and she, she hides in the toilet, as they say, which was really grossing me out because I want her to say bathroom, but that's not what they say in London. So she <laughs> keeps saying she, she hid in the toilet. So he didn't see her, but she saw him and she's like, I can't believe I messed around with a married man. And now this man is my boss. I'm getting Grey's Anatomy vibes a little bit because I think that's how it started. Even though he was, was in McDreamy, he wasn't married, mm -hmm. but they had messed around. They had a one night stand and then the next day your one night stand is your boss, which is crazy. Um, so her best friend is Sophie, who's married and has lots of affairs. And she's just like, go ahead, girl, get you some type of situation. I'm proud of you. And <laughs> which is like, whoa, okay. Um, and Louise has like a bit of an issue with that because her ex-husband cheated on her with a woman that he left her for and didn't even stay with or whatever. They have a son together. So she questions Sophie a bit about it. Um, and, and Sophie says, everyone should be allowed their secrets. You can never know everything about a person. And I thought that was very poignant. And it made me think this book is going to be about nothing but secrets, really, um, because that's what's been going on. What did you guys think about that? Or just about their exchange as a whole, too? I think her friend was... <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't agree with all the cheating thing, but the part where she was like, girl, you met a man at a bar and he says, I don't want to exchange names. I don't want to talk about our, like our lives, like any of those things. And you didn't think he was married. And I was <laughs> like, she's not wrong. Like that, like there is, I was like, it, I think it sets you up to kind of see that. He's naive. Right. Like there's some naivete there that she's like, or just. And even if it's not naive, it's just some some desperation where you're looking past what is clearly a red flag because you finally have this kind of second where you're attracted to someone. Mm -hmm. um, and I think in relating to the quote that she says, I like the last part of it, I think, where she says something to the effect of like you would drive yourself crazy trying to know someone's, all of someone's yes. secrets. And I think that part is true. Like, I think you can both do as much as you can to share, but there's always going to be like a random thought or whatever that you're not sharing daily. And if you were trying to know everything, then you would probably drive yourself a bit. Right. That's too much. That's very true. 
I like this chapter. I thought it was a good introduction to Louise. Um, I also thought it kind of like set us up to not necessarily root for her, but to see things through her perspective, right? Mm -hmm. Because immediately after Louise was introduced, I kind of, she became, I guess, my narrator for whatever's going on in this story. Um, So yeah, I guess she's like a proxy for the audience. And Mm -hmm. um, yeah, she's so far seems to be the most interesting character to me. And um, I kind of want to see where she's going with this or how she ropes herself into whatever she's about to rope herself into. Yeah. Interesting what Christia brought up about the desperation or the ignoring of red flags, because as we will probably get into in later chapters, like that comes up again where it's like, nothing's buzzing, nothing's like, (laughs) maybe not. (laughs) Right. Right. Yeah, I think also it's interesting that thus far what we've gotten with these other two characters is the like very mysterious, their narration is like stilted and you don't know what's going on. And then Louise's chapter is probably the closest you get to just like everything on the table, normal, right. like book reading where you're like, okay, we're settling in mm-hmm. versus the others where I'm like, what is happening? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I yeah. was like, I don't know what's going on here. Yeah, and Louise definitely puts it in your face, like lays it out on the table. So yeah. Um, we then learn that Louise has night terrors that lead to sleepwalking and also not enough sleep. Most of the terrors are related to saving her son's life. Um, and when I read about this, I, I immediately thought, okay, this is going to be a plot point. This is going to be something that ties something together. Um, and then we also find out that Adele, in a later later on, I'm going to talk about it, but we also find out Adele has night terrors too. So I'll bring that up later. Um, <clears throat> in chapter six, Louise goes to work. It's her boss's first day. She finds out his name is David after she gets caught in his office looking at photos of his wife. He's like, he didn't know she worked there. So he's like, what the hell? <laughs> like, I was just making out with you a few days ago in the bar and now you're in my office. What's going on? So she has to convince him like she's not a stalker. She's his secretary three days a week. Um, and then he he eventually believes her and they basically start working together like he wants help um, getting information about the organizations that he can volunteer with or whatever charitable work. So she basically starts acclimating him to the area and the job. But to me, I felt like he apologized, which he should have, but it also felt like they were still flirting a little bit. And- it did seem like they were still flirting. And again, bringing it to Christy's point, when she was talking about like showing him the map and about the town and she was like, hey, you know, by the end of the conversation, he knew all about Adam and my divorce and this. And it's like, she's like emotionally vomiting. <laughs> yes. A reader, but like- <laughs> To him, David, you know, yeah, it's like she doesn't know anything more about him and his life, but Mm. she has somehow revealed in the course of a work day (laughs) her entire life story. (laughs) And not even in the course of a work day, in the course of like an hour and a half, (laughs) short to call his wife. I just thought, like, I even the way that, and I don't know if the thought process was okay, I'll just move past this. This is what I would have asked any secretary is for this assistance. But I was like, I feel like once you all kind of like establish who you are, let's maybe take a second where you go in your office for a little bit and I'll sit at my desk and then maybe we can like come back and have a chat versus like, okay, well, let's now sit down and have coffee for an hour and a half. Like, right. That just was like, okay, let's establish some professional boundaries here. <laughs> we're none. There were none there. there were none. I was like, they finna do it in a few months. That's the only thing. <laughs> okay chapter seven is a flashback to Adele being in a sort of therapy home to help her deal with the death of her parents um we don't really get all the answers but she doesn't really want to be there um she doesn't really want to participate in the activities they have for people there um the people go on a hike she decides to decline and then she meets a new friend who also doesn't go a young guy and they have an exchange and that's how we find out why she's there that her parents have died in a in a fire 
um, the, the the death was in the newspaper, so it was a serious thing. But she slept through the fire, um, and we don't get much information. Like, was she in the house? Did she escape? Like, we don't get that much information about it other than she slept through the fire, and that has traumatized her. So she doesn't want to go to sleep because her sleeping through it led to her parents' death in some kind of way. Um, any thoughts about that? So oh, we. I, I'm sorry. We also learned that she had night terrors previously. So that's where the similarity between her and Louise pop up. Yeah, I thought it was interesting. I'm not sure if it's, I know it's within our nine chapters. I'm not sure if it's that chapter um, specifically where she says that David was the one who saved her. And she yeah. talked a lot about the fact that like, oh, I'm going to tell David I made a new friend and all of those kind of things. And I think that kind of establishes for us that I think she's like 18, I think she says, mm -hmm. that her and David have been in each other's lives for, for well. an extreme amount of time. And then mm -hmm. for the fact that David, for David to have saved her, one, this kind of like establishes this like savior complex between the two, where it's like, would you have taking care of her and married her and taken on this responsibility that hadn't happened for all yeah. of those things and it seems like I would think they had to have been neighbors or he was spending the night like for him to have saved her like they had to have been close so I think that's also interesting because I think that establishes some of the dynamic between the two of them I am tripping because I didn't even notice that she was 18. I'm thinking this yeah. was like a month ago or like a year ago or something like that. So thank you for pointing that out to me. Because <laughs> yeah, I was like, why is she talking to this little teenager? That's I, what I, was I, had to have a, I had a second of that too, where I was like, stranger danger. And I was like, oh, <laughs> she's 18. <laughs> Flashback. <laughs> right. TBT. Uh -huh. But yeah, the other thing I think or that made me start thinking um, about it in this chapter is that established how rich um, Adele is. So, cause it was kind of like this whole, well, they put me in this because this would harm dad's business. And David said, and I was like, well, would David not also be a young adult as well? Like why is mm. he types of decisions, decisions yeah. or giving you this kind of advice? Older with David, yeah. Well, that's what I was wondering, because we later learned that um, Adele is slightly younger than Louise. And so yeah. it makes me wonder if like, okay, is David, you know, Louise's age or older or, you know, what are we, again, it kind of, the, the writing throws you a bit off kilter because I feel like there are questions that don't get specifically answered in the um, beginning part of the story. But On I was purpose. Like, interesting. So I, I, I thought it was interesting that you were like, oh, would he have married her? outside of this trauma bonding and I'm like well she's loaded so <laughs> yeah, very well at least in my mind a motive as to why he is very unhappy in his marriage yet he remains in his marriage um to me yeah mm -hmm. yeah but also explain some of the ways in which she keeps saying like she pushes him to do to be more at the top of his game with it, like, because that might be what she's like used to versus like mm -hmm. have the money so you can do whatever you want versus like look good. We have to like keep up a certain appearance because that's what I was raised into. And I think it was chapter six or five where um, that they delve into that. Like she is a, maybe it was chapter eight. She, she seems to be a trophy wife. She's very, very beautiful. And that's her thing, being beautiful, making David look good as well. So in chapter eight, they wake up in the morning together in bed. They've had sex and she's excited because they don't really do that regularly. So that she feels like, oh, I'm maybe getting him back um, like he used to be. Um, and she kind of considers it like a reward. Like I did good last night because they had a dinner with his boss and the boss seemed to really take, take to her. Um, so... I guess she kind of views the sex as like a reward in a way or that they're getting back to how they used to be. But David kind of doesn't really seem to be tripping off her at all. Um, <laughs> like when he gets up to shower, he goes into like a different bathroom. So she feels some type of way about that. She makes breakfast and that kind of thing. Later on, he gives her pills for her anxiety, a cell phone and a credit card. 
So this indicates that she doesn't really have a lot of freedom because she didn't have her own phone and she didn't have access to her own money other than him putting money in her account. So now she can, I guess, use the credit card whenever or something like that. Um, and so I'm like, okay, what kind of hostage situation? What is, <laughs> what's going on? And also makes it seem as if beyond the like being in therapy, as if something happened. Like, yeah, something happened. Something happened in between then and now <clears throat> that she like lost privileges. So I feel like that's why I'm also <laughs> trying to figure out like what on earth. <laughs> so. Yeah, what is that about? Um, okay, so then after, so one thing that really uh, hit or struck me was he said, I'm going to be volunteering in the charitable organization. So I'm not, basically, I'm not going to be around. So here's a credit card, here's a phone. And the first thing I thought was, you're going to be cheating. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'm not alone. Because yeah. I was just like, huh? Because why give this to her now if it wasn't that you had plans to switch up how you were going to act? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Suddenly she needs a cell phone because you're going to be volunteering. And again, it was like very strange that she has no access to anything when she's the one with the money. So like, right. I'm like, how did David get in charge of what was, what I'm assuming was inherited wealth? Like, right. really going on here i was like we clearly need to watch the britney spears uh conservative ship (laughs) (laughs) right someone in the comments was like uh would like to note that he gave her an old phone yes capricia no internet (laughs) he gave her a nokia i I had a nokia when i was a freshman in college in 1999 so i don't know he on a joint playing snake on the phone (laughs) And you had the QWERTY keyboard. Yeah. (laughs) What? Okay, so that's very weird. And this is also when she mentions about the the cat being killed. And she buried it in the the Rose Garden. Um, And I thought it was something like she did it to get back at him because he didn't come home in time for something. And I was like, that's pretty weird. Maybe, I don't know. I was a little (laughs) sleepy. This is very strange. (laughs) (laughs) He didn't come home in time. I'm killing the cat. Like, why would you do that? (laughs) <laughs> you even like the cat like <laughs> <laughs> this woman is crazy um in in chapter nine <clears throat> um louise goes happy hour with her friend her son is um with his dad and so she goes to happy hour with sophie again and um she's explaining how the first day working with uh, her new boss went and I guess Sophie feels like, are you really trying to mess with him? Like she get, I guess she gets the sense that she isn't letting him go uh, or isn't just going to be a secretary. And she says, she says, um, don't shit where you stay. What did she say? I f- don't shit on her doorstep. That's what it was. Do not shit on your own doorstep. And it reminded me of, from what I've heard, when I've heard people say that they say, don't shit where you eat meaning don't mess around with anyone from your job. And I was like, oh, let me ask the ladies, how do you guys feel about that? Oh, I be- yeah. I mean, I say <laughs> don't get your honey where you get your money, but yeah, it's not appropriate. <laughs> yeah, well, I, feel, I feel the same way. When I started uh, my, more, my most recent job, um, I had a couple of people who were like, hey, and I was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> not here. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, thank you. I was like, I mean, it was made easier that they weren't people I was interested in, but I was like, yeah. uh-uh. Um, and I work for like a big company. So I was like, it would have to be that you are like everything I want and you work in a different one of our buildings. Like, yeah. Mm-hmm. You don't work in the same office. <laughs> like we right. don't interact work-wise and you have to be perfect. Otherwise. <laughs> I agree with that. Yeah, you have to get a different campus, different team. Like, I don't want to see you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I'm on the fence about it. I have never worked with anybody that I would ever be interested in. So there's that. Yeah. Um, but I'm also like, I always hear stories of like people meet, like especially teachers, they'll meet like their soulmate at work. So it's like, do you really turn it down if that's really the one for you? I don't know. I forgot the statistic, but a lot of people meet their soulmate at work. I think it's something like 70% of Oh, really? 
Yeah, it's like really, I know it's more than 50. I can't remember the specific statistic, mm-hmm. but quite a few people do meet their significant other at work. Yeah, I would say yeah. it definitely felt comfortable approaching me at work because it is common at my job. Oh, okay. I think where people end up kind of dating, not always same, I think the same division thing doesn't happen often, but it's very common where like either you'll see family members or you met your person here. Just mm-hmm. because it's something where people have been for like, it's not uncommon to see people there for 30, 40 years. Yeah. So, and you're yeah. there a lot of your day. So it's kind of, yeah. if you, you know, somebody cute, you might just happen to be like, oh, let's go to lunch. Let's just be friends. And then it develop into more. I just unfortunately have never had anybody cute at my jobs. Well, I work in women-centric industries, so. Oh, okay. <laughs> I kind of do too. So yeah. that, yeah, that's a barrier. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's a barrier for me. Brother. Um, but you definitely shouldn't be, well, maybe people have, but I don't know about affairs. Like, that's even worse. If it was just like, oh, I'm single, you're single, let's see what it do. But you're married and, and you're his secretary, so you're definitely working with him, mm-hmm. you know, one-on-one a lot. That's a bit much. Like, chill out, Louise. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so um further in the chapter louise has a weekend to herself because her son is with his father she realizes her life is just very uneventful so she's bored and just trying to you know get through the weekend when her ex-husband brings the child back he meant that the son is six years old he mentions that she'll he'll be seeing his dad the next week which was not the plan so louise was like what's going on and the father says oh we're going to france for a month because his new girlfriend is pregnant and wants to bond with their son. Um, and this is, this knocks Louise out a little bit because she's like, you're having another baby. They've been, I guess they've been divorced for like two years or so. Um, and it's, you know, kind of unsettles her to know that he's moved on like that to that point um, where he's having a baby with someone else that he's not married to. Um, so she says, no, the child cannot go. Um, and she tries to stand her ground. But when the son finds out he's upset, and he's like, you're just being mean. You just don't like want us to be happy, blah, blah, blah. So she feels guilty. And she agrees to eventually let the son go for a month on summer vacation with uh, his new step mama, kind of, and, and the husband. <laughs> and I felt like this is a setup for Louise to start acting up with David because she's she did say she felt like that her son is the one thing she has and now with this new family that her ex-husband has she's going to lose her son as well in a way so I was like she's going to get reckless I just (laughs) I didn't think she was going to get reckless but I guess that was because I was like I don't know I just felt deep empathy for her I did too even meeting David how it was like you know what like I haven't felt a spark you know in a long time and it feels Mm -hmm. like this and just being like a woman in your, you know, 30s trying to date or whatever. It's like, I found her. I was like, yeah, it is rough out here, you know? Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. um, so I did feel empathy for her, but you're probably right. That is probably what's going to trigger her to act the hell up. Is she going to have a month without her son? She could yeah, do whatever she wants. Right. So that's what I, I mean, I saw it as, you know, the author setting the scene for things where, you give us that Louise's kid is going to be out of the way. So whatever (laughs) happens there can happen. Mm -hmm. David saying, I'm going to be working late or outside of, you know, the house a lot. So how often will he be there or what he's, what is he going to be doing? And then you have Adele, that's her name, Mm -hmm. um, who has, who now has a credit card and some freedom. (laughs) And... (laughs) So we'll see like, where all three of them. I was like, you're kind of like moving the pieces into position yeah. for like fuck shit to happen. So. <laughs> Capricia said it's going to be a hot girl summer. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's what Louise needs though, because I was just like, girl, get out, you know, I enjoy yourself. So. South of France, like. Yeah, for real. And she's kind of cute, like blonde, voluptuous, you know, she's a little thick. Yeah. Like, like that. Yeah. Uh, so. Mm-hmm. Um, so then uh, moving forward in the chapter, Louise goes the next day to take her son to school. And uh, when she's leaving, she's not paying attention. She turns a corner and runs directly into Adele. 
So Adele and Louise finally meet. Of course, Adele doesn't know who she is, but Louise remembers her from the picture and she introduces herself as her husband's new secretary. And Adele's like, oh, let's go have coffee. And they go have a good chat over coffee and they exchange numbers. But Adele says, don't tell David that this happened today that we met. Let's let's um, let it be just between you and me. And I'm like, that's weird. What is going on? <laughs> what is going on? What did you guys think about that? I don't know what Chrissy was talking about. Go ahead. Sorry. Right. I was like, you're giving us this. And I think that's what, that's part of why I was really interested to nominate this when I had read the like synopsis, because it wasn't just about this like secretary and her boss situation. There also seems to be this addition of this relationship between the wife and Louise, which is, I think, going to be even stranger because then you have this weird, like, love triangle, relationship triangle situation happening. And I had said this when we were chatting before we started, that I think it's interesting that, well, one, Louise and Adele are our narrators. And then uh, two, they kind of reestablish that positioning by the fact that when we talk about her husband, it's the story she tells to her friend, like as they're getting drunk. And then the two, then mm-hmm. her and Adele have this meet cute. Like they bump into each other. Like she thinks she's so pretty. They go and have mm-hmm. coffee, they exchange numbers. And then we're reminded that it's weird when David calls. <laughs> He's like, don't tell my husband that we- Don't tell my husband. So Capricia says Adele is not allowed to have friends um so that could be why she responds that way and then somebody else mentioned her phone doesn't have the internet so clearly she's being protected from something she's either being protected from something or she's being kept from having a life outside of whatever she has now very and, freak i didn't hide the world from my kid i was hiding my kid from the world or whatever <laughs> yes <laughs> <laughs> yeah so this is um i'm like i I'm glad this is an easy read. Like, I I feel like I could finish this in maybe two days because I want to know, like, there's so much mystery, so many secrets. I'm like, let me um, take some time to really uh, stick with this because, you know, my interest is peaked. Um, One thing I also noticed was how Adele is supposed to be like the beautiful one. And Louise is supposed to be cute too, but Adele is supposed to be like this beautiful, this beauty, like she's known for her beauty. And I thought that their names kind of, represented that a little bit because Louise is like a grandma name like nobody is really named Louise in our generation and I guess she would be around our age right and then Adele yeah I think she's 27 or something like that who Adele or Louise Adele I thought yeah yeah I think Adele was 27 but then Louise is like probably in her 30s right yeah and you don't really meet Louise's (laughs) that's that age You know what I mean? So I thought that maybe the author was like trying to like really drive home the point. Like Adele has like this, you know, she's the beauty and she has this name that's a little bit more, um, I don't know, comment or uh, contemporary. And then Louise, even though she's okay, she's more of the, it almost made me seem like Louise was surprised David would talk to her because David is supposed to be very cute as well. He has these blue eyes that are very, um, mesmerizing and stuff like that so it almost felt like when Louise found out that David was married she was like of course he would be married because why would he want to talk to me type thing you know yeah. So, yeah. which then I think also kind of plays into that where you have these which I think is not an uncommon trope of having like these beautiful people and then someone being so excited to have their gaze upon them that mm-hmm. they're like whatever happens they're just kind of like sucked into their world kind of thing yeah Um, so it just speaks about that power and Mm -hmm. I forgot which chapter it is about how you know basically her beauty makes people kind of compliant and like you know it's it's the luck of skin and bones but yeah it's what I got I use it um Mm -hmm. so it is I do think it's going to be interesting to see how beauty politics play in this story. Yes. And later yes. when they switch out the races, how beauty politics plays, you know, in that story. Um, yes. That's a good point. Very, very good point. Okay. Any other points you want to make about the, the first few pages? 
I'm excited to read. I agree with you. I think this is a great spring book. Like I was on my, you know, in my backyard, sitting on my little like patio table reading and I was very into it. It was very engaging. So I'm excited to finish it and I'm excited to talk to uh, my chapter about it. It'll be our first time meeting in person in a long time because okay. most of us are in various stages of vaccinated, but I think by the meeting date, we will all be <laughs> fully vaccinated. So, okay. Hey. Yeah. Yeah. I'm excited too. I, I'm excited to kind of like see where we go. Cause I feel like these first nine chapters, I'm like, I don't have any idea of what's kind of happening. Um, and I, I had mentioned to you guys, I'm also kind of interested to see the ways in which they're going to use the them both having night terrors and things like that mm-hmm. and that was interesting for me because I've had night terrors so I know what that feeling is like my family, oh. my siblings all of us kind of have some sort of have had we all slept walk my sister has had the like witch on her back and I've had night terrors what's the witch on your back what is that so that's like the sleep paralysis where oh. you can it's the common one is that you there's a witch on your back you can hear her laughing and see her cape but you can't move oh my god I've heard of like other ones other people have like my another I think my other sister had one and like her baby was in the bed and she was like I can see my kid but I can't move to him so oh my god this is stressing me out just even hearing it I've had night terrors twice when I was like really stressed out it's only happened twice when I was studying for the bar and Mm -hmm. um and I had both of them. I thought I, I was covered in like spiders or bugs. So <gasps> one I woke up like standing in the bed, and one I woke up in the hallway. And I like I said, I haven't slept walk since I was a kid. And I laugh because I'm like, when I date, if I get like kind of serious with someone, I have to be like, hey, just a heads up. At some point, <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> like, <me> walking around. <laughs> you might find me like in another room. And so, oh no. Um, but so reading like her description, I was like, that is very much how that feels where you feel mm-hmm. very, like not in control of a situation. And it's not until you wake up that you're like, oh, okay, I guess I'm here. And it just makes you think about how strange like the brain is. So using it yeah. in this way, I think is kind of interesting. All the time I've had my tear is when I eat Chinese food. So I don't eat Chinese food. Really? Yeah, like, I guess they're not night terrors in that I can't, it's not like what Christy is describing or even what the book's describing where I can't move, but I wake up frightened, like something is trying to harm me. And so so that's closer to what mine are. I don't have the paralysis because clearly I'm in another room when I wake up. So... (laughs) Um, I think Bridget said she's had the witch on her back. Yeah. Time. So yeah, so that one's con- and that's a strange one because I'm like, it's strange that there is a way in which there is this common experience mm-hmm. where it's you know like you would think like okay you have sleep paralysis it you have a dream about whatever the fact that there's this common experience of a witch on your back I think is what's strange where everyone yeah. has a similar one because I'm like mine isn't something that. I mean, I think it's a fairly not like bugs, you know, but that specific scenario, I think it's strange that there's this common occurrence of it. Well, it's a throwback to the book we read um, back in the day by Angela Flournoy. The um, Turner House? Yeah, because all of them, they called it Hanks. Um, oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I got the hang at the bottom of my bed, but it was the same situation, like just night terrors and how it was like almost genetic. Um, mm-hmm. interesting I don't know that is scary y'all look <laughs> I would not I'm a very scary person as far as nighttime is concerned like I'm so scared of Freddy Krueger um so to be waking up with a witch on my like I would just be like I'm just gonna stay awake for the rest of my life <laughs> that's why I can't watch that thing on Amazon because I was like anything that's even remotely scary I don't I, like I just don't believe in it I like I don't like what, what on Amazon so I can stay away what from the two yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm not watching it. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> so it's funny. My mom, my mom is, we're like, clearly that's where we got it genetically from. My mom has really bad, like she has like night terrors and okay. um, she occasionally like screams in her sleep. Um, oh, gosh. So that's fun. Um, but we all like got something in that way. But my mom loves horror movies. So I'm like, why do you want... <laughs> 
Yeah, like you like watch the fire. fire and then have like a night. Probably read the correlation here. So let's not even vote for what was the other one this book was up against? Um, the HBO mm. show. Because like I don't play with demons. Oh, like, Lovecraft. Oh, Lovecraft. <laughs> yeah, somebody told me it was scary or it was like uh like horror horror and I was just like you know what though I am a scary person but I really enjoyed reading Lovecraft Country oh yeah yes I was like I want to read more horror because it's not it's like in your face but not you can't you can visualize it but whatever you visualize is your own yeah visual Mm -hmm. so it was easier for me to digest and I was like I want to read more horror with black folks like it was I liked it. I was surprised because I am a scary. This is the girl person. that watched Ghost Dad as a child, and I had to sleep with my. <laughs> oh, no. Wait, you had not Ghost Dad. <laughs> I've been new about Wait. Bill Cosby. I've been new. I've been new. My intuition told me. Oh my God, I had that on VHS as a kid. That was not scary at all. <laughs> Why was he haunting her? <laughs> I don't like ghosts. That is hilarious. So. <laughs> okay y'all uh <laughs> <that there>? <laughs> <laughs> we have actually gone over probably about 30 minutes uh-huh. um so clearly we are even though we don't know what's really going on we are in it we're enjoying it enough to have a lot to say about it so i'm hoping everyone watching also has delved into it or will delve into it and enjoy it and have a great discussion the d- the drink is the illicit affair which is not really the name of the drink, but we changed the name of the drink to fit <laughs> fit the book. It's basically gin and juice. Gin and like pineapple juice and something else. So um, make your drinks, mix your drinks up and prepare for a great meeting, drinks and discussion with your chapters. And we'll see you next month for, um, next month is our first sci-fi selection. We're reading Dread Nation. I had, the book is like over here and I can't reach it. So I can't show it to you, but um, hopefully everyone will purchase it from um, the bookstore we're trying to support for March. I'm sorry, for May. It's semicolon um, in Chicago. You can easily purchase it at bookshop.org. All of the information is in our newsletter for spring. We're trying to support our bookstore this year. Um, so go ahead and order. And someone, I think it was Liz, said, Liz from the DC chapter, I talked to her yesterday. She said she ordered a book from them and got it in two or three days. So it is, you know, they're trying to catch up to Amazon, and but they're also supporting bookstores um, um, with the purchases, which is great. So go ahead and um, purchase that, and we'll be doing the first impression for Dread Nation on May 2nd, which is the first Sunday in May. Okay. All right. You guys have a great Sunday. Yeah. Talk to you later. Bye.